What is up, everybody? Happy Tuesday. Welcome into an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I am your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. It is Cooper DeGean Day for those who celebrate. I am so excited. If you are on YouTube, you can see me. I am beaming today because I think this is going to be a tremendous conversation, a tremendous breakdown, and I think one that is going to be hopefully super informative and help you sort of make your determination and decision as to whether or not Cooper DeGene is on your list of potential Packers in this upcoming draft. Before we get there, a couple quick announcements. First of all, shout out to Herman Lorenz for becoming an all-new Packaday Podcast YouTube member. Of course, make sure to go check out all those Packaday Podcast YouTube membership options. You won't regret it, I promise you, so check those out. Also, just a friendly announcement for two friends of the show, Packer Report and Cheesehead TV. Both of them recently released draft guides that are Packers-centric that you are not going to want to miss. They both do an amazing job of breaking down the prospects and how they would potentially fit in Green Bay. You can find the Green Bay draft guide over at PackerReport.com. You can find the Cheesehead TV draft guide over at Cheesehead TV. Tons of friends of the show that are involved heavily in making both of those guys guides, and both of them are amazing. So support them. This is not a paid advertisement by either. Uh, just again, friends of the show, I want to support both of them as much as I can, so make sure to check both of them out. And of course, as I've been talking about, I'm going to personally be doing a live NFL draft show at the Timber Rattler Stadium, a live Q&A, if you will, uh, April 19th, $10 gets you in, ticket to the game and a ticket to the live Q&A. And you know, answering all of your draft questions gets you, again, a box seat ticket, access to the live Q&A session. It's going to be an hour long. I'm going to be throwing out the first pitch, which should be comic relief for anyone that needs that in their life. And uh, I will put the link in the show notes as well, so make sure to check out that as well. We had some news on Monday, not a ton, but... Former Packer, early second round pick, Kevin King, signs with the Atlanta Falcons. Remember, two years ago, took the year off for personal issues. Last year, had an injury that he sustained while training to get back in shape for the NFL. And now he is officially back, a member of the Atlanta Falcons. Great to see Kevin back in the league, have the opportunity to compete for a spot. Not necessarily upset that that's with another team and not with Green Bay. I think it's time for Green Bay just to move on and go in a different direction, uh, but happy that he is going to try to resurrect his career and will be a fun sort of story to keep an eye on in Atlanta. And also another cornerback news, Kool-Aid McKinstry, corner for Alabama, was in Green Bay for a visit on Monday, top 30 visit for the Packers, and uh, they'll get a closer look at him as they evaluate whether or not he could be a pick in the draft for the Packers, either in the first or second round, likely first round guy, maybe early second, uh, you know, if Green Bay moves up or moves down, dependent upon uh, if it's the first or second round pick, but another top 30 visit for the Packers with Kool-Aid McKinstry visiting on Monday. So let's jump right in though, because I can't stand it any longer. I want to talk about Cooper DeGene. I know you guys want to hear about Cooper DeGene. So let's address the elephant in the room first. He had his amazing pro day on Monday. And I think a lot of people are wondering, or even just stating out loud, well, there it goes. He's no longer going to be in play for Green Bay. That might be the case. That could be the case. I personally don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that he is available at pick 25. I think he could go as early as maybe 15, somewhere in that range, maybe to Indianapolis. I know they love high-end athletes. They could absolutely use a corner. I do think Quinion Mitchell is a little bit probably more their type, but DeGene could be in play there as well. So he could go well earlier than Green Bay. I think it's possible he could go right in that 25 to 28 range also. And we also know that Goody's not immune to moving up in the draft and has the ability to do so if he falls in love with a player. Whether or not that's DeGene, we'll talk about that today. But I still think it's well worth everyone's time to go over a player that has been probably the most mocked player to Green Bay throughout their draft, has been a player that has been somewhat polarizing, but I think the vast majority of fans are really excited about and would love if he ended up being a Green Bay Packer. And others are a little bit concerned based on some of the stuff that they've heard or read or maybe saw on tape themselves. So let's break down all of that today. But again, addressing the elephant in the room, I don't think it's an impossibility that Cooper DeGene could end up a Green Bay Packer, which is why I still think it's super important to go over him today. So at his pro day, he measured in at six feet and five eighths, 202 pounds, 
Ran somewhere between a 4.43 and a 4.45 40-yard dash. We don't have the official time yet from the pro day. Um, different scouts, of course, are going to have different times. And uh, so it comes somewhere between 4.43 and 4.45. Either way, very good time for him. A 38.5 vert unofficial and a 10.4 broad jump also unofficial. But either way, these numbers are fantastic. These numbers were expected. He did not do the, the short shuttle. He did not do the three cone. So we do not have agility testing. There's always the old adage in NFL scouting circles of don't count it twice. And what that means is if he tested or if he played super athletic in college and then he tested super athletic in his testing, all right, that doesn't change anything. We already knew he was super athletic. He's been super athletic since high school, his entire life, track and field athlete. We knew all of that. We knew that going in. Now, if he tested terribly, that would have been a red flag that we would have to go back and watch his tape a little bit closer to see, hey, did we miss something? Or if he tested like just at a whole nother level, like a 10.0 relative athletic score and tested just through the roof, that also would have been something because while he's an incredible athlete, anytime you go into that upper echelon, you still have to like do a double take. This is about exactly what we expected from DeGene and I think that that's a good thing. That's what you wanted to see is to sort of carry over what we saw from the tape into the testing. And that's exactly what we got. So it's great that he tested great, but we expected him to test great. And this just sort of confirms everything that we saw on tape. And then, of course, the next question becomes, well, is he a Green Bay Packers type? And specifically, when we've done our first round analysis, we know that they love high relative athletic scores, players from a power conference, younger players. And are they a premium position player? So let's go through that. His relative athletic score unofficial is a 9.89. That also, again, is an incomplete score, not just because it's unofficial, but because it also does not include any of the agility drills. If he tested poor in the agility drills, that could bring that down. It probably still would have been over an 8.0 relative athletic score, which is really sort of the threshold as of late, it seems. Again, they're not using it specifically, but when we look at it, they want an 80th percentile type athlete at their positions. I still think he clears that even if he did not test well in, in the three cone and short shuttle, but it is unofficial and it is incomplete because he didn't do agility drills. Either way, from an athletic standpoint, he checks the box there. Power conference. Yep. University of Iowa, Big Ten. We're good there. Age. He just turned 21 in February. They love their young prospects going back to Kenny Clark and amongst other players it gives them more time to develop. It gives them more time to get to that second contract. You get them in their developmental years. And when they get that second contract, theoretically, you get them in the prime of their career. So this is a win as well with him just turning 21 in February. We know they have really enjoyed taking players from Iowa in the past. So that fits. And the premium position question is an interesting one and one that we will discuss in very great detail today because premium position outside corner, yes, Premium position slot corner, no. Premium position safety, no. So does Green Bay value him as an outside corner, a slot corner, or a safety? But as I talked about yesterday in the Edger and Cooper, when they're in that 25 range, they do go outside of their preferred ideal preferences every once in a while. As an example, Darnell Savage at safety, Quay Walker at off-ball linebacker, and Devontae Wyatt, who is overaged at age 24. So later in the draft, in the first round, they seem to be a little bit more lenient, at least maybe on one of those, which even if DeGene is a safety, it doesn't rule him out because they took Savage earlier than what they're picking at 25, should he be there at 25. So overall, it does seem like he sort of checks all of those first round boxes for Green Bay, just depending on where they value him and if they think he's a, a outside corner. And again, even if not, it's not completely an eliminator either. As far as cornerback traits go, and again, you can get these from the Green Bay Draft Guide, so check that out. They prefer a seven-second or less three-cone. That we don't know. My guess is he probably would have checked that box, but we just don't know it for sure. He there. They want corners who are over 190 pounds. Checks that box. They want a 4 6, 40 or under. Checks that box easily. And they want somebody who somebody who is 5'10 and 7 eighths or bigger, again, at least based on their previous draft picks at corner. And he checks that box as well. So the question marks left of whether or not they would sort of take him are the agility numbers, which we are just not going to get prior to the draft. And is he a premium position player? Those are the two questions. But other than that, he checks everything else, both as a first round player and as a potential corner or defensive back uh, in Green Bay's defense. So how would he fit within Green Bay? 
I think that's part of this that we have to go over as well. I think the first thing is you have to evaluate what he did in college. He played a lot of outside corner and you are making a projection as to what he will be in the NFL. And I think what we need to sort of glean or try to understand is how does Green Bay value him and where do they think he fits? Because I think this does matter. If they believe he is a true outside corner and that he can be a legitimate starting corner on the outside long term, I think they very much value him with that pick. And I think the reason being here is even if he doesn't play there now, meaning maybe he has to play in the slot to begin with and take Keyshawn Nixon's spot, or maybe he needs to play as a safety until that outside corner spot opens up. That's okay as long as they project him long-term as a starting corner. And the reason that I say that is you look at somebody like a Rashawn Gary or a Lucas Van Ness, they didn't need to start him right away in order to feel like they had value. So it's almost like a bonus that they think maybe he can be an outside corner eventually. But in the meantime, rather than just having to sit behind Valentine and Stokes and Jair, maybe he does compete for that spot right away. But if not, there are other positions that he could slot into, no pun intended, that could still make him valuable in the time being while they're developing him as an outside corner or while they're waiting for that outside corner slot to open up. I think his versatility, which we will talk about as well, is also something of value here for Green Bay. Regardless of where they view him, the fact that he could fill in as an outside corner, an inside corner, a safety, a punt returner, a gunner on special teams, there are a ton of places where he fits in and can have an impact right away for Green Bay, which is also going to add value. But where he fits and how Green Bay values him could potentially and theoretically determine whether or not they are high on him in the first round or at least would maybe be willing to trade up for him in the first round. If they don't view him as that potential starting outside corner, I would say it's maybe less likely that they're aggressive in moving up than if it is the you know, or if they do feel like he can be an outside corner long term. Uh, let's get into more of the scouting report aspect of this because I think this is going to be the most important part. Overall, as we talked about, six foot and five eighths, 202 pound defensive back from the University of Iowa was a junior this past season. And as mentioned, he just turned 21 years old. Some background info. He was a quarterback and a defensive back in high school, quarterback, not cornerback, quarterback and defensive back in high school, set all sorts of records, went 25 and 0 in his final two seasons as a high school uh, def- or a high school football player, had 3,500 passing yards, 35 passing touchdowns. 1,235 rushing yards, 24 rushing touchdowns, and four interceptions on defense in his final or in his uh, career as a uh, high school player. He also lettered in baseball, basketball, and track, uh, was a 100 meter dash state champion as a senior, was a four star high school recruit going into college, was a top 150 prospect coming out of high school. Signed with Iowa as a safety, which I think is a little bit telling and a little bit interesting, but did transition to corner and primarily played corner in college. And also, as a basketball player he in high school, averaged 25 points per game, 7 rebounds, and 7 assists. So we are talking about a well-rounded athlete here. In 2023, in college, he was a unanimous consensus first-team All-American, was a first-team All-Big Ten player, Big Ten Defensive Back of the Year, return specialist of the year, and it is noteworthy as well that he did break his fibula at the end of this past season, which is why he didn't do all the testing until recently, but he did just send a letter to GM saying he is full go, did the testing on Monday at the University of Iowa with his pro day, so he seems good to go and the injury does seem to be behind him at this point. His stats this past season, 41 tackles, two tackles for loss, two interceptions, and five pass breakups. Also in 2022, it should be noted, he had three pick sixes in 2022, which was a huge highlight um, and record-breaking season at Iowa for him having those three pick sixes in one season. In his career, 120 career tackles, five tackles for loss, no sacks, seven interceptions, three touchdowns, 13 pass breakups, no fumble recoveries, and no forced fumbles, had one carry for eight yards on offense, had 31 punt returns, including one touchdown and a 13.1 yard average. Also, his best punt return of his career, which was dynamic and explosive and amazing, was called back because he put his hand up to sort of like see the ball. And then he made a uh, sort of like don't touch it gesture, like waving the rest of his players off. It very clearly was not a fair catch. And then he went on this ridiculous punt return for a touchdown, but they ruled that it was a illegal fair catch signal. So they brought it back. But 
That was his most explosive one, so it should have had two punt returns for touchdowns. Also had one kick return for 20 yards. It was set up to be a trick play against Wisconsin where he was going to throw it to the other side of the field. It didn't work, so he just returned it and got 20 yards out of it. But primarily a punt returner in college, not a kick returner. From an athletic standpoint, uh, we talked about most of this, and again, these numbers are unofficial from the Pro Day at this point in time, but a 9.89 unofficial relative athletic score, and again, incomplete, not having the um, agility drills in there. 80th percentile for height, 93rd percentile for weight, 79th percentile for bench press, 88th percentile for vertical jump, 76th percentile for broad jump, and 87th percentile for 40-yard dash. Those are at corner, not at safety. Per PFF, in 2021, he had a 65.5 grade on 11 snaps. In 2022, he had an 88.5 grade on 814 snaps. In this past season, he had a 77.4 grade on 705 career snaps. He had a 78.6 run defense grade this past season, a 76.6 tackling grade, and a 76.8 coverage grade. However, one thing I want to point here, in his career, He has a 63.7 coverage grade when in man coverage, albeit in limited snaps, but he has not been as effective as a man coverage corner per PFF with their grades as he has been as a zone cover corner. More on that momentarily. Uh, This past season, PFF had him at zero total pressures. He was used primarily as a outside corner and just literally playing corner. So he didn't have a ton of opportunities there. Had a 12.2% missed tackle percentage, but his coverage numbers were insane. He was targeted 46 times, only 20 completions, a 43.5% completion percentage, 194 yards, no touchdowns, two picks, four pass breakups, a 37.8 quarterback passer rating when targeting him. He did have three penalties, but he was phenomenal as a cover corner statistically this past season at Iowa. It is also should be noteworthy that this past season of his 705 snaps, 630 of those were played as an outside corner in his career at Iowa, 1192 of his career snaps were at outside cornerback 163 only were in the slot 116 were as a box safety and only one snap where he was a free safety. So he did not do a ton of deep safety work did minimal box safety work, minimal slot coverage work, and primarily outside corner work, 1,192 snaps of it. So when we talk about what he is or what he isn't, in college, he was very much primarily an outside cornerback. And the rest of it, while we did get a little glimpse in the slot, did get a glimpse as a box safety or a box player, we didn't get a full breakdown of that and certainly have not seen him as a deep safety. Those are certainly slot and box safety are more of a projection and, you know, with a little bit of sort of tape to go off of, but deep safety or free safety is a complete projection at this point for Cooper DeGene. As far as where he ranks on current big boards, Daniel Jeremiah has him at 25th. Pro Football Focus has him at ninth on their big board. Mel Kuyper has him at 21st and the consensus big board has him at 22nd overall. So a little bit closer to being gone at pick 25. Again, Jeremiah has him at 25 on his board, but leaning probably towards Green Bay needing to move up if they do want to get him. And his pro day is certainly probably only going to accelerate things to moving up that draft board a little bit. Even though, again, like I said, we don't want to count it twice. All right, let's go through his strengths. This is my scouting report from watching his tape these past two seasons at Iowa. I think the first thing is that we have to talk about his projected versatility. We talked about it a little bit, but on defense, I do legitimately believe he has outside corner potential, slot corner potential, some box safety potential, some, you know, um, what I would call two safety potential. I don't think he's really an ideal sort of post safety, but either way, we're talking about safety corner and slot corner potential on defense. I also think he is a ideal gunner on both the, you know, obviously punt coverage. And I think he can be uh, a coverage guy on kick coverage as well. And then a ideal punt returner for you as well. So we're talking about a player who is going to bring a tremendous amount of versatility from day one and give you a lot of options of how you could use him. And he is a player that based on his skill set, you're going to want to find ways to get on the field 
And he even played like Keyshawn Nixon last year, that one end around. Uh, he even had one offensive play for eight yards. On a, you know, So they were trying to find ways to get the ball in his hands and just allow him to be a playmaker again, even using him a little bit on offense, even if it was just one play. So the other thing that I think is important about that versatility and something that I think is always great to have when you're selecting somebody that high and putting that much value on them is he has outs. And what I mean by that is, you could think that he is a ideal outside corner in the NFL, but let's say you get him and he doesn't fit as an outside corner in the NFL. Well, think of it as like a quarterback, right? And this may be the extreme example, but most positions, if you don't work out, there's not other positions you can just move to. In most cases, maybe if you're a safety, you can move to a linebacker in some instances. Maybe sometimes a corner can move around a little bit. But for the most part, if you are drafted to play a certain position and it doesn't work out, you're just sort of screwed and you're done. But with DeGene, the there's the legitimate factor that he could come in and be an outside corner and maybe it just doesn't work at outside corner. All right, let's try him in the slot. Slot doesn't work. Let's try him at safety. Safety, like there are different things that you can try with him. And if the one doesn't work that you were expecting, there are still other outs where he could fit and be a weapon for you on defense and on special teams. Even if your primary objective for him, hoping he's going to be an outside corner, even if that didn't work, there's other ways that you can try him. And hopefully you should be able to find a way where he can fit within your defense and he'd still be a playmaker and still be a big time player and still get value on him, even if it wasn't what you were initially expecting. Next thing, ball skills and playmaking for days. He is a big time playmaking corner that has a knack for finding the football. When I broke down Adrian Amos, I would always talk about how consistent and solid he was while also being allergic to the football. Like that dude could not get a fumble or a ball to bounce his way or just like a tip pass that would go or a quarterback somehow overthrowing someone in the middle of the field and him just getting an easy pick. That ball avoided Adrian Amos at all costs. Not the fact with DeGene. That ball has a way of finding him. Now, he didn't have any forced fumbles or fumble recoveries, but not only does the ball find him, but more importantly here, and more specifically here, he finds the ball. And he had some other opportunities, too, that he could have had more picks than I even think what he had. I think he even could have had more pick sixes than what he had. He has a knack for getting to the football and making things happen. Those three pick sixes in 2022, very indicative of that. Multiple big-time plays. The punt return skills show up. As I mentioned, he had one punt return for a touchdown. Should have had another. That's the type of playmaker he is. And he makes uh, like over-the-shoulder catches on a couple different occasions. Plays where the wide receiver stops and he just goes to the back of the end zone and makes a toe drag interception in the back of the end zone. He drives on the ball incredibly well and reads the quarterback's eyes and is able to make those really quick I'll say Charles Woodson-esque interceptions where he just reads it and dives in and is able to make those plays. It's not, a, nobody's at the level of Woodson. So let's just get that out of the way. But there's some similar type of plays where you'll see where Woodson was able to undercut stuff because he had such a natural feel and could read quarterbacks so well and would kind of bait them in. DeGene has a little bit of that as well. So the playmaking and the ball skills are there. And let's just be clear. That is something that this Packers defense has been sorely missing and why they put so much value in a Xavier McKinney who has those skills. They need some playmaking. They need some ball skills. So getting a second guy who can do that would be super valuable for Green Bay as well. He projects as a great blitzer from the slot. We saw more of that in 2022, did not see a ton of it in 2023, but not just as a pass rush blitzer, like meaning uh, in, in the passing game. He's also a good run blitzer, which we saw in 2022 and projects that way in the NFL as well. That big, thick physical frame that he has is really, really good for that. He's not going to be overwhelmed at the point of attack at corner. He's going to be able to take on some running backs if they try to pick him up. So he projects as a very good blitzing slot corner or safety, uh, either in the run game or in the passing game. There are some really fun uh, plays on tape where he is in the box that he shows great instincts, where he is very patient. We're, we talked about Edrin Cooper staying patient. Like there are plays where he's like lined up basically as a linebacker. And again, go back to 2022 for this, where he's super patient, makes the read, fills the hole. The running back tries to bounce it to the outside. He gets to the out, outside and makes a play on the outside. So if you want to use him as a box player, he showed some really fun stuff as a box player, specifically in 2022. 
Uh, also, he's willing and capable as a tackler, big physical blend of a player, and he plays completely unafraid. Remember that Jair Alexander play where he threw a wide receiver in, or uh, yeah, I think a, a blocker into Justin Jefferson and just goes like, you know, basically um, completely wrecked the play. And then Jefferson had to try to like bounce his way around and they made the tackle well in the backfield. DeGene has a similar play where he goes right through the wide receiver, kind of throws the wide receiver back into the wide receiver screen and just sort of disrupts the entire thing. But he is unafraid. He will come up and make a hit. He will take on blockers. He will do what he needs to do. And he just feels like he's going to get the job done one way or the other. And you love to see that physical, unafraid, just sort of intensity and caliber of play. We talked about playmaking being something that Green Bay's defense needs. We also need to see a little bit more of that intensity and physicality. And DeGene, from a cornerback standpoint, brings that to the table as well. He also plays with extreme confidence. And this is a player who, in high school, in his last game as a senior state championship, scored the game-winning touchdown as a senior. As I mentioned, basketball player, track star, football star, baseball, lettered in everything. He has been a stud athlete his entire life. And he plays like he is constantly in, in control and in command. He's confident. He has a swagger to him. There's a play on tape where a wide receiver tries to block him and the helmet pops off. And with like, out even like trying, he just does like, he, like the helmet comes off. He like catches it midair, like whips it behind his back. It's just like everything just has a calmness, a coolness and a, I don't even know how I want to define it. Just super, super confident. And you love to say it's not overconfident. It's not. Um, cocky. It's just a calm, cool, collected confidence that you need as a corner. You need that level of confidence. If I, you know, he can get beat, he's going to come back the next play and pick you off and take it to the house. That's the style that he plays with. And that's exactly what you need from your defensive backs. He's extremely young, 21 years old with tremendous growth potential and upside ahead of him. Uh, shows off great speed and closing ability coming forward. We're going to talk about on the negative side of things when he turns his hips and runs the other way. There's some issues, but when he's off either in zone coverage or playing from deeper or even at a, as a box player and he can trigger moving forward, that speed shows up, that acceleration shows up, the explosiveness shows up. There's a play on a crossing route where he's playing off and it's a crosser over the middle. He comes from off coverage on one side, goes all the way to the other and just annihilates the wide receiver. Those are the sort of things that Green Bay's defense is severely lacking and you really want to see as a, you know, again, an off-ball corner. The question is, is how much of that are they going to be doing in Green Bay in 2024? We'll talk about that in just a bit as well. Natural backpedal, very comfortable dropping into zones, and he has great natural anticipation, high football IQ, really good instincts, all things that allow him to make all those playmaking plays on the ball, get his hands on it, pick it off, and do all those sort of things that make him that spectacular playmaking corner on the back end. So a lot of strengths that any team is going to be enamored with in some capacity. However, as with every player, there are weaknesses. The first thing is you as a team, I think, need to have an idea for what he does best and where he's going to fit and what position he's going to play at. Now, as mentioned, there are outs, there are options, and you can always try them at different things if the first one that you are hoping for doesn't succeed. But I think there are legitimate questions everywhere. And what I mean by that is there are some stiffness or there is some stiffness in his hips and his ability to sort of turn and change directions, specifically when up in man coverage and then transitioning to go back and run with a player. There's some issues there that as an outside corner, I think need to be addressed. And while he has the ability to play off zone cover corner, I don't know that that ability as an outside primarily man press corner is what he's going to be ideal with. So you have to answer that question. In the slot, I believe that some really twitched up, super fast wide receivers are going to give him issues. I think those Miami wide receivers in the slot would give him nightmares. The Jalen Waddles, the Tyree Kills. Now they do for most players, but I think those type of players are going to give him a lot of problems. And players that are on two-way goes, I think are going to give him a lot of problems. Meaning you can get him and you might fake one way and have the ability to go in either direction to, based on what DeGene does, I think that could give him a lot of problems in the slot. As a safety, 
While I think he can play box safety, I don't think that's his ideal fit. I don't think post safety is an ideal fit for him either. I do think too high safety coming back from like that Joe Barry defense. I think he could play that very well. And I've gone back and forth. When I first watched him, I said, he's an outside corner. Then when I rewatched him, I'm like, no, I think he's a slot corner. And then the more and more that I watched him and got a complete feel for him and was sort of had this complete comprehensive scouting report, the more I felt like he is a too high safety. I think that is ultimately what is going to be his best position. Could he play slot? Yes. Could he play outside corner specifically in zone coverage? Yes. I think there's options there, but I think you better have a plan for him on how it's going to succeed. I want to be crystal clear on this. He is not Josh Jackson. He is a better player. He is more versatile. He gives you more options. He has the ability to play safety, which Josh Josh Jackson never did. But what you ran into with Josh Jackson when Green Bay drafted him, he was an off-ball zone outside corner in college that projected as an off-ball zone outside corner in the NFL. And what did they do? They did not play him as an off-ball zone outside cover corner in the NFL. In fact, they had to start putting him in the slot in man-to-man coverage, and he was just screwed from day one. They tried him a little at safety. They finally got him to outside corner. I think he lost confidence. Nothing ever fit. And well, again, it's not apples to apples. I think you better have a plan for him on where you want him to play and give him the tools that he needs to succeed at wherever you do want him to be at his primary position. As I mentioned, he has that stiffness in his hips and when transitioning. And specifically, this shows up when he is in man coverage up on the line of scrimmage and wide receiver gets past him and he has to transition and start running the other way. As I mentioned earlier, his speed coming from off coverage, going towards the quarterback or towards the line of scrimmage is fantastic. His speed transitioning and going backwards and trying to catch up to players, I actually feel like he is lacking some of that closing explosiveness going back that way, coming up it is evident and prevalent. Going back, he gets beat on some big-time plays down the field. There were back-to-back games last year, Ohio State, and then I want to say it was Purdue, where he gets beat clean, deep. And there were other opportunities on film where if quarterbacks throw a better ball or can get it down to him, where he would have given up more big plays. So I have some concerns there. Like I said, the two-way goes, I think, can give him issues. And I think man coverage simply could be a struggle for him as he transitions to the NFL. I'm not saying he can't do it, but I think that transition to the NFL playing more man coverage could be a problem specifically at the start. Now, I do think he can play corner, but I do believe zone off ball corner is what he would be best at if you do want to play him at corner. And that's where we have to talk about Jeff Halfley's defense. I don't think there is an ideal fit here in Jeff Halfley's defense. If they're going to play man coverage at zone and slot corner, That's not what he does best. You are using a little bit of a square peg in a round hole in those sort of positions. If also you're in Joe Barry's defense where they're playing zone outside corner, zone slot corner, two high safeties, I think he could fit at any of those positions. But if you're Jeff Halfley and Jeff Halfley is predominantly going to use man coverage on the outside, man coverage in the slot and a box safety and a post safety with that post safety basically having you know, Xavier McKinney's name on it. I don't know that there is a perfect spot here. If I were to guess right now, I think that safety spot next to Xavier McKinney, him playing predominantly in the box would be where you would play him to start. But you would have to have, like I said, a very good plan. And I don't know that there is an ideal fit there right away in Jeff Halfley's defense. He also will show some signs of panic and he starts grabbing at the catch point. That's something he needs to clean up a little bit. That predominantly happens in man coverage zone. He's playing back. He can see the quarterback. Everything's in front of him. And he feels a lot better and a lot comfortable, a lot more comfortable in those sort of situations. Inside, when he's in the slot, he will get taken out from bigger players from time to time. I'm not concerned about it. That's going to happen to all slot corners. And he has the level of physicality to hang there. Just something to note nonetheless. He's big enough. He's physical enough. I don't have any concerns. I also would say, like, at that slot corner, you're not getting necessarily an intimidator there. So if you're hoping for like this you know, hulking, big, intimidating corner that's going to bring a huge physical approach. He's physical enough and more physical than most, but I don't think he's like an intimidator there either. I do think, as I mentioned, that moving forward, he has that burst and acceleration going backwards, that transition, and then re-accelerating. That I don't think he has the same level of closing speed and acceleration that we see when he's playing in off coverage. 
And as I mentioned, he gave up some really big plays in the passing game, specifically in 2022. There could have been more. He didn't face a lot of big time offenses in 2023 that potentially could have taken advantage of that a little bit more as he played more off or excuse me, uh, more um, outside corner. But those were some concerns definitely that I had in giving up some of those big plays down the field. As far as his fit and scheme fit, the versatility is a benefit no matter what. Like the fact that you have the potential to play him at numerous positions and on, on special teams as a gunner, kick cover guy, punt returner, there's a lot of value that there's going to be there no matter what. I do think his best position is ultimately going to be as an interchangeable or cover two safety, maybe as a slot or outside zone corner, as long as you're playing predominantly zone coverage. But the man coverage does give me a little bit of pause and cause for concern. If I had to guess right now, if Green Bay drafted him at 25 or moving up, I think his initial spot is next to Xavier McKinney, but they would have some options to say the least. As I mentioned, I don't think he's a perfect fit for Jeff Halfley's defense, but I want to add one other thing here. While I don't think he's a perfect fit at any one position in Halfley's defense, based on what Jeff Jeff Halfley said about the type of players that he wants and fitting his defense to the players that he has, I have a lot of confidence that Jeff Halfley would find a way to use him at the best of his abilities and find a way to make him a super successful player. This is too talented of a player and too smart of a defensive coach that wants to be able to use his players to the best of their ability for them not to find something that works. So I do have faith that they would figure out something to utilize him that would bring his strengths to the forefront and hopefully minimize some of those weaknesses. And right away, I think he could compete at outside corner with Eric Stokes and with um, Carrington Valentine. I think he would compete there. I think he would very much compete at slot corner with Keyshawn Nixon. And I think he would probably immediately right now, if there was a game this Sunday, would be the starting safety next to Xavier McKinney with no question whatsoever. He's just better than anyone else at safety on the roster right now. I also think he'd be, I think he would actually be their primary punt returner. I think he would beat, beat out Jaden Reed and Keyshawn Nixon. I think he's a better, more clean punt return catcher than Nixon. And I think he's more dynamic and explosive as a punt returner than Jaden Reed. So I think he'd be their punt returner. And then I also think uh, he would be a potential gunner on special teams from day one as well. So there's a lot of value there. My final thoughts. One, how does Green Bay value him? If they value him as a legitimate long-term outside corner that they feel can play man coverage, goes up their draft board. If they think he's predominantly an off-ball zone cover corner, maybe can't hang in the slaughter on the outside and predominantly view him as a safety, then the question becomes, is he an ideal safety in Jeff Halfley's system? And if not, he just might not fit perfectly or they may not value him as much. Doesn't mean that he's off their board. Doesn't mean that they wouldn't even potentially take him at 25, but it might mean that they're far less likely to trade up for him because he's not that ideal perfect fit. And if he's not, then they just don't get him. Some other team might take him ahead of 25 and he's just gone. So that could be a potential issue there too. Um, I think there are reasons why it makes sense. The fact that he can compete at so many of those different positions, the versatility, the playmaking, all of it, and just giving that type of player to Jeff Halfley, there's there's a lot of reasons to like that. I think there's reasons it doesn't make sense. The fact being that I don't think there is a perfect position based on his skill set in Jeff Halfley's defense. I think there are going to be fits with other teams that make more sense for DeGene than with Green Bay and teams that value him higher. And then that brings you to the question is, should Green Bay move up for him? And this is a lot of people thinking like, hey, you've got all this draft capital. Go get this guy. Go get him. He's this He's this perfect fit. He's Iowa, super athletic. They need corners and defensive backs. It's perfect. I don't agree. I ultimately don't think that he is a perfect fit for this scheme, for this defense. And I personally have enough question marks and there's enough of like, yeah, it's great that he can play all of these positions, but is he going to be great at any of them? Specifically that, like they feel that they can fit within this athlete defense. I don't think you move up for him. Now, my final, final, final verdict here, to me, he quite easily projects as a first round pick. I'm not saying that this is a bad player. I'm not saying that this is not somebody that has a ton of traits that are desirable. I'm not saying that some team might not take him at 15 and get a all pro Hall of Fame player at pick 15. That's within the realm of possibility. That's a high level projection, but this is a easy first round evaluation for me, but 
You have to figure out what his position is going to be, where you value that positional value if he's not an outside corner. I do think he is a far enough talented player that if Green Bay takes him at 25 or if they trade up to get him, there is so much to like there. I certainly would not be upset by that. That'd be a really fun, exciting player to add to this defense. And I would be so intrigued with how Jeff Halfley uses him. And maybe my ultimate takeaway here is I talk about all the time that these players, it's not about what you did in college. It's what you project to in the NFL. And I will say this, if you are somebody who really wants Cooper DeGene and are dying to have him be a Green Bay Packer, what I will tell you is that everything that you want to see, whether it's at outside corner, slot corner, or safety, he has on film. Zone coverage, man coverage, press coverage, playmaking ability, interceptions, run defense, slot, outside corner. He doesn't have that safety experience, like that deep safety you know, experience, but Every trait that you need to be successful as a deep safety, he has shown on tape. There is glimpses of all of it. So that's sort of what you want to see is like he he can get there. So I think there is a projection there, whether it's at outside corner, slot corner, or safety that you can feel comfortable with because you've seen at least some of it on tape. But there are all of those concerns that we mentioned. I don't think he's a perfect fit. I would personally not move up to go get him based on the fit within this defense. And he could just be gone at pick 25. As I mentioned, I think there's other teams that probably value him more than Green Bay because he's a better fit for their scheme. If this was still Joe Barry, I think he is a unbelievable fit in Joe Barry's defense. I'm not quite as sold for him being a unbelievable fit in Jeff Halfley's defense. And if you're going to move up for that type of player and go from 25 to 18, 19, 16, whatever it might take to get him, You better make sure that he is a, you know, checks every box that you want him to check and that he's going to come in and be that perfect fit pretty much from day one. That's why I don't necessarily see Goody going up and getting him, nor do I think that they should go up to get him at that point in the draft. Is it possible that he is Green Bay's pick? Absolutely. Well within the realm of possibility, either via move up or just him falling to 25. So that's why I think it's important that we discuss him. I think it's important uh, that we cover him. It is probably not what I would do. I probably wouldn't uh, move up to get him, and I probably wouldn't just even take him at pick 25, as crazy as that sounds to maybe some people, and as disappointing that that may sound to some people, because I know there are a lot of people in Green Bay that have fallen head over heels with Cooper DeGene and want him to be a Packer no matter what. Like The the draft card says DeGene no matter what. I get it. The last thing I will say here, and what I want to do for all of these breakdowns is the least, the single least important thing on this entire breakdown is what I think. And what I mean by that is I know you're tuning into my channel and listening to this. So you want to know my thoughts on it, but what I want to give you are the strengths and the weaknesses, what he can do, how he projects and how I think Green Bay will value him. That that's my goal. What I think and what I would do doesn't really factor into all that much overall. Green Bay's taken a lot of players that I thought would be good and that I've liked. They've taken a lot of players that I did not like. Sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong. It, quite frankly, does not matter all that much. What I want to give you is the vision of how I see him right now, what I think he can become, and how he would fit in Green Bay. I think he is a first-round player. I think he is a really fun athlete. I think he fits in a variety of different defenses. I don't think he is that 1A perfect fit with Jeff Athlete's defense but I would be excited and intrigued. And I don't know if I would go as far as like thrilled, but yeah, like I would be really interested to see how we would fit in Green Bay. And I definitely in no way think that it would be a bad pick. And that's what I would say to you is if you are on the Cooper DeGene, no matter what train and like he can do no wrong, know that there are some legitimate concerns as to how we will transition to the NFL and specifically how we would be in man coverage. And for all of you that are hoping that Jeff Halfley's defense is going to be a lot more physical, a lot more aggressive, a lot more man, that should give you some cause for concern and some hesitation to be like, all right, maybe it's not an ideal fit. And for those of you who are on uh, or like off the Cooper DeGene train and say like, listen, this guy's not going to be a fit no matter what, know that this is a unbelievable athlete who has shown a lot of playmaking ability that any good defensive coordinator will find a way to utilize in their defense and should bring a level of intensity, a level of playmaking, 
And I think a uh, just fun player on the back end of the defense that you should be able to utilize no matter what. So whatever side you're on, have at it. I would love to see your comments below on if you think after going through all of this, yes, still on the Dejean no matter what train, maybe you're on the trade up for him. Maybe you're on the, hey, if he's there at 25, take him, no question about it. Or maybe you're like, you know what? I think Green Bay would be best going in another direction. And as much as I will tell you right now, I think it might just be better for Green Bay to go in a different direction, even if I would still be fine with them taking him. I also don't have a perfect answer for what they should do at this point. It is something I'm very much struggling with for Green Bay at this point of like, who's there, what they need, and just that perfect fit. I don't have one yet at 25. There's maybe one way that I'm leaning, and maybe I'll go over that prospect very soon, but you're going to have to wait on that one. Hope you guys appreciated and enjoyed this Cooper DeGene breakdown. I know it's long, but this is a big time player that a lot of people are super interested in, and I wanted to give it all the time that it deserved. Of course, I'll be back here tomorrow with an all new episode. Make sure not to miss it. Make sure to subscribe. Check out those Pack a Day podcast YouTube memberships. Shout out to our Hall of Fame and All Pro members, Most Hated Minnesotan, PJ Wynn, John Wild, Shea Bradad, Brandon Paletta, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donald Lee, Lori Lord, Baby QB, David McCluskey, Donald Decker, Bremen, David Prendergast, and Dan Miller. See you guys tomorrow. Until then, go Pack Go.